But before we get started, uh, we have a really important question. Yep. Um, w- what should we name our podcast? That's tough because that's actually the reason I haven't done a podcast myself is I can't think of a good name. It's honestly the hardest part. It is. Well, now that there are three of us, the name is Three Friends with the Podcast. I'm a filmmaker. I'm a scientist. And we're two friends who've made movies together. And launched a company together. And we lost our money. And our identity. But we are finding ourselves again. And this is our podcast. This is it. Welcome. This is episode six, where we welcome our first ever guest to the microphone, recording artist John Mark McMillan. John Mark is an accomplished singer-songwriter and is very forthcoming about his journey as a self-sustained full-time creator. We talk about it all, when his dream became a plan. We talk changes in the music industry and how to stay afloat. We talk the economics of making a living off of music streaming, where you get paid in fractions of pennies, and the inconvenient truth of social media marketing. Plus, John Mark explains the biggest mistake he sees young artists make and his own dreams for his future. And I asked him about which 90s album still holds up, and his answer was a huge and welcome surprise. Skip the banter, let's dive straight into our conversation with John Mark McMillan. Excited to introduce uh, my good friend John Mark McMillan. John Mark is a singer songwriter. He is a platinum selling artist. He's toured all over the world in stadiums and in little dive bars. He's released a dozen records, including eight original albums. His music was even featured on the last Terminator Dark Fate trailer, where he's covering Bjork. Um, and uh, Justin and I, our first film, Fair, John Mark's music is really the theme, the core of that movie. I've known him since I was 18. He grew up with my wife's family, and uh, his success is is equally about his uh, his art and his talent, but also his hustle. So let me introduce John Mark McMillan. Welcome to the podcast. Yo, it's good to be here with you guys. Thank you. John Mark, you have, as long as I've known you, like I said, you've wanted to... Be a songwriter, yep. be a musician, be a rock star. Talk about not just when you wanted, you had the dream, but when you made that dream a plan, because it feels like it's it, it started at an early age. Is that is that true? Yeah, definitely. When it became a plan was probably, I'd kind of been doing it for a number of years, part time. And my wife and I decided we were both going to leave our jobs. And so at that point, is when it really became a plan. I, I felt this pressure to have to do something. So we that's the first time I ever remember sitting down and taking a piece of paper and a pencil and writing, like, what am I going to do if I leave my job and I don't have another job? And I'd, I'd kind of done this before. I worked restaurants and things like that. And, you know, those types of jobs you can quit and go do the music and then come back and pick up shifts. And I'd done that kind of thing. But we, my wife and I had worked at a church for a while and uh, I had like a salary position and, um, and we both felt like um, our time was running out in those positions. I actually went to ask for a promotion and they were like, yeah, we'd love to promote you to this other department where you'd be better fit, make more money, the whole nine yards. Just like, but do you really want to do this? And I was like, well, if I'm honest, no, <laughs> I don't really, you know, I mean, I enjoyed it. I would have been good at it. I think I would have been a benefit. I wouldn't have been a bad person in that spot, but that's not what I dreamed about when I woke up in the morning. It was something else. And so I knew saying that meant I was out of a job. And so I didn't feel bad about it, but it felt like it was time. And I, I told the truth. I was like, yeah, I don't really dream about this job. And, um, and, and so um, I had a little bit of time to do something else, and I thought, well, I decided that what I really wanted to do was do the music thing. So my wife and I got together and was like, what can we do? This is the age of CDs. I'd already recorded a CD, and 
I think I'd recorded two albums at that point, actually. And um, we took a bunch of CDs and we mailed them to stores around the country. <laughs> right? Literally mailed them to stores around the country with a little note, you know, said, if you want more of these, you know, uh, this is the price breakdown, <laughs> You know, and we also, which by the way, a lot of those places ordered boxes of CDs and they'd sell them and then they'd call back and order more. It was great. You know, obviously you sent out, I mean, we sent out like, you know, a hundred of them or something. Um, but we had a handful of places, little bookstores mostly, um, who would sell our CDs and, you know, email us and order more. And then on top of it, we made a list of like every person we knew who may know somebody who may be influential in a place we could go play music. And we sent an email, individual email to every one of those people and um, just told them like, Hey, we don't have jobs. You are friends. And if you know of any opportunities where we could go play and we got a lot of opportunities that way, they weren't all great, but that's kind of how we got started. That's the first time I remember sitting down and writing up a plan um, was that moment when we left our jobs. What are we talking about here when you you were doing this? Is this like uh, 90s, 2000s? This was the early early 2000s. It was probably 24, 25. Okay. Now you mentioned, you know, you were in a job, you were married, and then you took a real big step and really quit the job and pursued yep. mm-hmm. the dream in a real tactile way. Bring it back a little bit because by that point, you already re- recorded two albums. Yep. Was your hope as a teenager, look, this is what I want to do but I don't quite know the path. So I'm going to record a couple indie albums for no budget and see how that does and then get a job and figure it out. Or did you try something? It didn't work. And you're like, oh, I guess I got to get a job now. What what happened kind of between, you know, being a teenager and learning how to play or, and then yep. actually recording those first two albums. I just wanted to be in a band originally. I just want to play. It was the nineties. Being in a band was like being a famous YouTuber, right? <laughs> it's like every kid wanted to do it. And not all kids are going to get to be it, but it feels possible, you know, it feels like something I could do. So being a band and something is magically going to happen, maybe. If not, I'm with people and that's great. That's probably what I really wanted, just to be around other people. I wasn't very athletic, so I wasn't playing sports. My other hobbies were like drawing comic books and you do that alone. So I'm a very social person, so that was not helpful to my social life. I don't know that I made a specific decision, but at a point I realized, oh, playing the guitar is something I can do with other people and looks cool in front of other people if I do it right. And so I started doing that more, playing the guitar more and drawing less, just maybe naturally because I'm a more extroverted person. But then I had this weird time in my life, and I try and explain this to people. It's hard to explain to people who weren't in the culture. I remember being involved... Not being involved, but I remember a lot of negative things happening in my world. Friends and, you know, normal negative things. Friends and drugs and that kind of thing. When you're in high school, all the things your parents, you know, pray you don't get involved in. There's a lot of negativity happening in my world. I was not happy. I was somewhat depressed. And I thought one day, like, I want to do something different. I want to make a change. I remember being a teenager thinking, I want to make a change. My dad's a pastor, so I figured this must have something to do with God. So like, well, how do I do something with God? And, you know, being, you know, 15, 16 years old, the only thing I could think of is like, well, I need to get people in a room and sing together because that's what they do at church. Started inviting teenagers over to my house. And we ended up having so many kids in the house that my parents let us move the furniture out back. I was going to play the guitar and the girls were going to sing. I was like, this is great. I um, guess we're doing something exciting, you know? Um, so I started playing the guitar and the girls were so nervous because so many people showed up that they wouldn't sing. So I had to try and get them girls, singing. like friends? It, just Yeah, they, they have friends. There's specific yeah. two or three girls I knew who liked to sing. I invited gotcha. them. I thought, I asked them, like, if I play the guitar, would you sing? You know, like, and they were like, yes. And I started playing the guitar and they didn't start singing. So I started singing, hopefully, hoping they would join in. And they never really did. They never really took the lead. But people sang, and it was fun. And I was like, whoa, what's happening here? Like, I'm like a shaman. I'm like <laughs> playing the music. And like, I decided when that happened somehow. 
you know, we start playing and the people respond and there's this God thing and this spiritual thing and this music thing happening. And I'm like, I'm kind of in charge and it's scary and also really exciting. So at that point, I was like, well, maybe I can do this thing, you know, and I started writing songs. I was going to go to college, but I could never decide what I wanted to do. And in this sort of season of me, like reinventing my life in my late teens, I decided I want to take time off from college and go to a ministry school, get my life straight, spiritually speaking. At least this was my thought, you know. Um, once again, being a young, or an older teenager dealing with depression and anxiety and those types of things, not really having that language, but finding in my religion, finding some something to hang on to. I thought, well, I'm going to get this straight. So I went to a ministry school, and once again, I wanted to to be involved with other people. So it's like, well, I can be on the stage. I realized I'm not good enough to play the music, so I better have some songs. So I started writing songs. And it took a long time before they would, or it felt like it took a long time before they would let me play on the stage with the other people. Do you have a sense of when you feel like, hey, I'm good at writing songs? Like, these are good songs. Yep. I'll tell you, yes, I'll tell you exactly when. So I wrote some songs and no one would let me play they wouldn't let me play the songs very often but the kids pastor heard me and he's like hey come play and I was like all right they let me play I'll sing my songs for the kids so I remember singing my songs for the kids at like a big conference once again this is so interesting you understand it Thomas right, right. a lot of people don't understand the subculture that I'm in sure but this was massive like church conference culture where when I where I grew up like, I'm playing music for, like, 300, you know, kids. Kids meaning, like, actual children, right? And they had a real band and a real sound system. So I'm playing one of my songs. And really, it's just, you know, the kid's pastor was my neighbor. He liked me. He's like, get involved. The kids think you're cool. So be on the stage with us. So let you do some songs. And I would sing my songs. I remember the band who was playing, like, the big event heard me. And they they asked me to come sing. Um, songs in the sort of big event. So I um, I went in the big event and I stood up on the stage and I started strumming for my song and I got so nervous I couldn't I couldn't sing I couldn't open my mouth. So sort of in reverse to how I started singing, the background singer started singing the song and then I joined in on the chorus and then the whole crowd picked up on the chorus and joined in and started singing. And I remember walking away thinking, like, wow, that was really embarrassing and also that was insane. I was like, these people are singing songs I wrote on my front porch when I was depressed, right? And I knew from that moment, I was like, okay, maybe this is something I can do. This is definitely something I'm going to try to do. Mm. See, that was definitely in my early 20s. Well, it's interesting because of the subculture that you were around and grew up in, you had a venue. You had an opportunity yep. to play your music in front of a crowd yep. as opposed to a traditional route, which would be, you know, the 15-year-old learns how to play guitar and then he goes to open mics or he goes to clubs. You did the clubs, but it's almost in reverse maybe. Mm -hmm. So you had, an, you had an opportunity, you had a venue, and that allowed you to sort of find your voice to the point where, hey, I want to record an album. Yep. And then a second album, and then up to the point where you, you know, actually quit the job and make it a plan. So you'd recorded a couple albums by, by then, ostensibly because you were having success. People liked your music. They said you should record. You wanted to record. Yeah, well, people started asking for the songs, like immediately. People started asking, or not immediately, but during that same time period, people were like, where's that song? I was like, I don't, I don't know. I just wrote it, and I played it. And people were bummed. And I realized after a while, as I would write songs and people would come up and ask me where they could get, could get those songs. I was like, oh, sort of supply and demand. And I realized if I had something, people would buy it. So it's like, really, it's really interesting because it's totally the opposite of way, the way most people would approach it now or even the way I would approach it right now. Like there was already a somewhat of a demand for my songs. So I ended up recording my first album, my parents at that point realized I wasn't going to college and they'd saved up a little bit of money and they gave it to me to record my first album. I think it was like $8,000, which I don't know how far that would go in college today, but not very far. But eight <laughs> 8000 bucks they gave me to record my first album and I already had people who wanted it. 
you know, this is without the internet. This is no marketing. This is nothing. It's just me playing at some church conferences, and we were playing occasional clubs and things like that. People wanted it, and I made it, and people bought it. You know, it's so interesting. People work so hard now to f- make a record and then figure out how to make that record relevant. Mm-hmm. But for me, like, I knew it was relevant because people already wanted it. You know, and so I was really making the record almost as a service to the people instead of like making something and then trying to figure out how to get people to feel like they need to have it. Mm. You know, and so from the beginning, sort of the whole idea of supply and demand made sense do you feel do you feel like that is uh possible do you still you believe that we still live in a world where that can happen because i i I struggle with that a lot that the idea that i mean that you can get anybody to pay attention to anything for more than five seconds yeah that if you are if you don't already have something that sort of draws people it draws people's attention then how do you get them to you know look at your art well, I think it is very, very, very hard. I would I would hate to say that it's impossible anymore, but it's definitely harder now than it was back then. It's it's harder and easier in some ways. So it's harder really because there is so much out there. Yeah, so much noise. Yeah. Um, but the the reason there's so much noise is because I mean, I had to come up with, you know, as a kid who at this point was working at like the Olive Garden, I had to come up with eight thousand dollars to make a record. Then I had to come up with another two or three thousand dollars to print the CDs. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you told most young artists that you meet today, like, yeah, you're going to need a minimum of ten grand to show up to the table, a lot of them wouldn't be able to come up with it. So it's sort of like there was a high cost to entry. Yeah. So now there's a low cost to entry, but there's just like a massive amount of competition if you want to call it competition so it's sort of like the trick back then was to figure out how to get your foot in the door now your trick now is like you're in the you're already in the door the trick is to how to get get people to care yeah you know back then i really just needed people to like one song and to hear me play one time and buy my album once and if you had several thousand people do that you're making a good bit of money as an independent we would go out and play these little I mean, I played almost any venue you can think of, right? We would go out on the weekend and sell like 100 CDs, right? And we used to sell them for like 16 or $18 a piece. So we'd go out and sell 100 CDs, make $1,800. As a young couple, that was like a solid little weekend. Do that four weekends in a row. Or, you know, I had friends a little older than me who would go out and sell 1,000 CDs every weekend. Wow, damn. Some of them would sell like 1,000 CDs a night. I have one friend in particular, I don't want to say his name, but I know on the reg, he was selling like a thousand CDs a night, playing four nights, three to four nights a week, a minimum of two to four, minimum of two, maximum of four. It just fly out, fly to each city, play these big events, sell a thousand CDs a night sometimes and go home and you're selling them literally at 14, 15, as much as $18 a piece. So you go out and make $18,000, you know. That doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. But that's what we had when we started. But it is. It's a high cost entry, but you didn't have as much uh, competition. There wasn't – the waters weren't as murky as they are now. You mentioned the, even the way you're breaking down CDs and weekends, um, you know, it sort of shows the entrepreneurial brain that you already kind of had or at least being your friend, I, I, I observe in you and I really attribute a lot of your success to that – when did you – like were you conscious of that back then or when you and your wife made the plan to quit the job and and kind of pursue it? Talk about the entre- tre- entrepreneurial aspect and if that was something you kind of adopted then or you had to kind of figure it out as you went because you know, if you're going to work for yourself, which an artist is, you've got to understand at least some basic business, right? Yep. I'm not entirely sure where it came from. I think some of it was just – sheer anxiety over if this didn't work out I didn't know what I was going to do and so I start I just started figuring like what are all the resources available to me and one huge resource was people going to the school that I was that I'd gone to and a lot of people they moved back home and a lot of them if I was doing worship music for instance a lot of them were at they went back home to work at churches so I realized like 
if there's 50 of these people who want me to come do something, I can go play in 50 different venues and sell CDs in 50 different places. And and as I did that, more opportunities would present themselves. But I'm not really sure where it came from. Did you have like a quota that you felt like I got to hit this number of shows or this number of CDs in order to make this bottom line, this budget? Were you thinking that? Yep. No, I totally did. I was like, well, if I need to pay the bills, I wrote down our bills. I was like, okay, there are multiple different ways we could make these, you know, I need to be doing X amount of concerts, selling X amount of CDs and I need to make sure that I save enough money to record the next album. So as money comes in, it would go into a bank account, which is really interesting. So my parents gave me that $8,000 that they had saved for my college, and I record that first album. I wasn't able to live off of that first album. It was really after the second album. But it was almost like that first album was like a micro lesson in being an entrepreneur, because... My parents didn't want the money back, but I felt some sort of, that I owed them something. I owed them to make it work because they'd given me the money, but I didn't have this actual um, weight on my shoulders, but I, but I also didn't want to let them down. They believed in me. So I had to do all the little things. I had to plan. I had to figure out budgets and how much musicians were going to cost and then had to figure out how much money. If I wanted to make the next record, I was going to need to sell a certain amount to make that. Then the amount after that could go to, um, you know, to paying bills or to buying gear or that kinds of stuff. So it's almost like I had this little micro kind of lesson in music industry. Um, I also was around other people um, who had been in the music industry, and I would ask them questions and try and glean and learn things from them. I started taking averages each night. Um, we would sell this amount in CDs, this amount in merch, this is what gas costs. And so I came up with an average, uh, like a worst case scenario, best case scenario, you know, looking back on all of my shows. And then um, I would make plans based on usually the worst case scenario because I was scared, right? Like, all right, well, worst case scenario, I need to do this many shows a year to pay the bills. Or, I, you know, I need to sell this many CDs so that I can do a new record, um, and then the rest of that money can come to me. So I made that separate bank account. All the CD money went into that. And actually, we started making money pretty quickly on the shows themselves, which I didn't really anticipate. And so I never really tapped the CD money. So I created that separate bank account even before my wife and I got married, and it always stayed separate. And that's one of the things. It's so small, right? It's so teeny, but we create. I created this other account. This was only business money. Like this was a different person. This was not me. And I had these guidelines for how this money could be used. It only could be used for X, Y, Z. And I just did that as sort of an anxious young person who knew what it was like to work at the Olive Garden and then get to go play music and then have to go back to working at the Olive Garden. I was like, working at the Olive Garden is great, but when you leave to go do your dream, going back to the Olive Garden is hard. Right. And so I didn't want to do that again. And so I created this, you know, XYZ. We're allowed to tap this bank account. This is belongs to John Mark, but it's not me. It's another invisible person named John Mark. I get to use his money, but only under these circumstances. And all CD money went back into that. Then, of course, it became digital downloads, iTunes. And the iTunes account was connected to that account. So when it made money, it all went into that account. And so that became seed money for me to do all the things that I wanted to do. And so I've never... Become... You still have that account? Yeah, I still do. Yeah, I still have is that, that account. Still your, is that still your revenue account for your, your art? It's, it's still one of them. Yeah, now we have multiples of those. So I actually have a couple of different businesses and a couple of different savings accounts and some different... Um, now I actually have some um, investment accounts where I'll put money where it'll make money while I'm not using it. Then I can borrow it from myself and put it back. But that, so a guy told me this, because once again, I didn't go to college. My wife actually went to business school, so maybe I'm giving myself too much credit. Maybe <laughs> some of this was her idea. But at the very least, she was on board with me. So I've talked to friends who have this, where I'm like, listen, you your business needs a bank account. Like, If you are spending all the money that comes in, especially when people go freelance for the first year, they're like, ah, we made this money. I'm like, yeah, but 
you need a new computer. You need some gear. I'm like, well, you should do this. And they're like, you need to print some merch. They're like, oh, I can't. I was like, well, why not? <laughs> you know, it was like, because you spent the money that came in. It's like, you need a firewall. Yeah. Yeah. But I got, a guy told me recently, he's like, you know, the, I mean, recently, it's a few years ago, but I've been doing this a long time. He's like, you know, the first rule of business. I'm like, what? He's like, never use your own money. I was like, <laughs> God, I've been using my own money this whole time. So I started to think like, okay, maybe instead of keeping a certain amount of money in my bank account to make a record, maybe I can put that money in investments and I can figure out other ways to pay the record on, in small chunks instead of just paying the whole thing off at once. And then that other money will increase in value. So we've started doing that more and more. So, But it all started with that little firewall account where it's like CD money always goes here. None of it comes out except when it's supposed to. We only use it for what we're supposed to use it for. Then later in the later in the game, we started pulling a salary mm. from that account, but the salary became part of the expense, right? It's like okay, we can afford to expense from the account, but it's still like that money belonged to that mm. person, not me. Mm. It's funny. I think the you know I've heard that same rule before, a business rule. I feel like that business rule is for people that ha- already have some amount of success yeah. in business. I think the real first rule of business is something that you were living by that I would sum up as uh, live like you're poor for as long as you possibly can. Exactly. And we did. And just pretend like you have no money. And however you're living, it doesn't matter how much you make, don't like keep driving the, the, you know, the 89 Honda Civic until the wheels fall off. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that's where people, you know, should, should start. I mean, that's kind of what it sounds like you did. Yeah. Well, no, that's literally what we did. So, even after we were doing pretty well, like I was still driving the band van for the longest time. We didn't. We went for a long for a long time without changing our lifestyle at all, to the point where I wasn't really even paying attention. And then after a while, I realized there's another rule, which is um, if Mama's not happy, nobody's happy. <laughs> and in the beginning, when a big, you know, in the beginning, like I get a big opportunity to go play a big show, do a big tour, my wife would be like, "You have to do it." She traveled with me at first, and after we started having kids, it got hard. She's like, you have to do it. Then after a while, literally, I was going to go meet Bono in um, San Diego, but I just got back from a tour. My wife looked at me, and she's like, I don't care. There's always something cool (laughs) happening. Like, you act like this is the only time you're ever going to have a great opportunity. She's like, I don't care if it's Bono and Springsteen. Like, there's no way (laughs) you're going to San Diego this weekend. I was like, all right. But here's what I realized. (laughs) Is that you said it like that? Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Some tears and drinking. But, hey, you know what? Not a lot of people get to say that they turned down. <laughs> Bono. Bono. That's true for their wife. <laughs> I mean, uh, I can't say that. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. She needed to feel like I was enjoying the success. Like I really don't care about. I mean, I like we have a nice house now, but like I really don't care about having a nice house. I don't care about driving a nice car. <laughs> I want to play nice guitars, and I want to tour well. You know, like to me, like my hobby was my business. Like I loved it. My hobby still is my business. And so, but if I was having these wins and I was feeling the win, you know, but she was at home and she wasn't feeling the win. And I was like, I realized, after, well, actually my manager told me, he's like, every now and then when you have a big win, you got to pull a little bit out so mm. that the whole family feels it. Because if you're just sacrificing and you don't feel it, you don't feel a big win, then there's little... You know, like I said, my wife could care less about what opportunity came up at that point in time because it it didn't feel like a win mm. to her. It was just me being gone. So there is a point when you got to, like, take a little bit out, you know. But for the longest time, we didn't do that. For the longest time, it all went back into the business. All right, coming up, our conversation with John Mark continues, and he shares the biggest mistake he sees young artists making. And it's a valuable lesson for any artist who's pursuing the freelance dream. Stay with us. When do you feel like you had a sense of having arrived and if you never felt that way then that's also something interesting to explore too of just like hey this is I- i'm making a living and i'm able to actually make you know 
an increasing living. Like, you know, there's a path for me to actually retire, you know, have retirement. Yep. When did that, when did, did, was there a moment or was it, you looked back suddenly and were like, well, damn. No, it was more the second. Like, it was more like, whoa, I can't believe I've been doing this this long. Like, I just kept thinking like, all right, this is going to be the album that everyone hates. And this is going to be the moment that no one buys this and I'm going to have to go look for a job. And it just never happened. And then it was one day I was like, whoa. I was like, remember how I thought uh, I always wanted to do this for a living? I guess 10 years in, this means this is what I'm doing. You know, but it never, there was almost never this moment where I'm like, we've made it. Mm. Part of it is like, I'm, unfortunately, I am, and I'm trying to deal with this. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm probably too success oriented in certain ways. Like I've had goals at this point, because your goals get bigger every time you achieve one. It's like before you even get there, when you feel like you're going to cross the finish line, I'm like already looking for the next one. And so like I <laughs> yeah. don't often celebrate and I've had to stop and say, hey, you need to celebrate all these moments because they all matter. And if you're just looking for the next thing, like you're just running, you're not, mm. <laughs> you know. And so that even now, so now being a little bit older, it's less common for someone my age to blow up in music. Um, not that it's impossible, you know. Um but I'm like, oh, okay, like, am I supposed to wind down now? Or, you know, so I'm always feeling like I got to keep hustling. I got to keep working. I got to keep growing. I got to stay connected with people. Um, because I feel like if you let up for too long, you're kind of out of the game. And for instance, like I had um, a friend I was talking to, and they sort of took a break for a number of years, and they wanted to get back into music. And they actually had a pretty big name and sold a bunch of albums and people did their songs. And and I was like, well, what? Do you, I was like, this is what you got to do. And basically, they didn't have any social networking presence. They had none of their music was even on Spotify. And I was like, well, what do you got going on? I was like, you got that big email list, right? Because that was probably all that they had. Which, if they still had, like, I don't know how long people keep the same email, but if they'd still had, like, 100,000 emails, they could have jumped in their presence pretty quick if people still had those emails i don't know what the statistics are um but they didn't they they had lost all those emails and i was like i really just don't even know what to tell you you could start doing youtube videos or doing what everyone else is doing but if you don't have any way to connect with your fans you know so i've always been afraid like i can't let off the gas for too long or i don't want to end up in that spot where I have no control anymore. It's like, it mm. almost takes as much hustle to do that as it does to like hone your craft. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that seems tough. Yeah. <laughs> like mentally to, cause it, cause it seems like it takes such different parts of your brain. Like you got to bifurcate and cause I feel like you can kind of overlap the, you know, what you were talking about earlier, the business and the creativity because they were so intertwined. But then this like social marketing feels like, just such a, I mean, and it could just be that my brain, it's foreign to me because I, I haven't tried, but I don't know. That seems really tough. Well, it used to be because there was a point I signed to a record label and we were building a team. It used to be that you could come up with a marketing plan and you could pay people to execute it for you. But now, like, I can't really pay anybody to post on my Instagram for me because no one knows exactly I mean, they'd have to stay at my house and take pictures of me doing stuff, you know, like it right. really, and for a while it actually worked. For a while I had my marketing team. I had like a bunch of people had my Instagram password and I had a bunch of people who would post, who could post for me. And I had one really good person who she'd worked with me a long time. She knew exactly how I said things, but that's where we're posting like once a week max. And we're, I remember thinking like post more than two times a week, people are going to get annoyed. That was back when people saw everything that you posted. And we were all, you know, and so, but nowadays you have to be, you pretty much, I mean, there, there are some exceptions, but for the most part, it's like you as an individual have to be engaged. And I, I enjoy it enough. It's not that I don't like it, but I hate that I'm kind of, uh, I'm forced to do it and forced to do it a certain amount. Like I would rather spend, I'd rather take months off and work on an album. But if you take months off now, when you get back on, the Instagram algorithm is going to hate your guts. <laughs> yeah. So when COVID hit, I started doing um, videos of me playing acoustic 
you know, versions of my songs. Like I posted one a day. I was averaging four to five of those a week for several weeks and it started to grow. Like my Instagram was really growing by, you know, a thousand to two thousand a month. And Instagram is similar too. Like if you look, I get almost as many unfollows a day as follows. So it's really interesting. It's like the goal isn't to get follows. The goal is to get more follows than unfollows. Yeah. Net. You know, so constantly. And so net follows. And then after uh, the George Floyd situation happened and uh, there was so much animosity and I had so many like super hateful, angry exchanges with people. I'm like, I am off social media. And so I took like weeks off at that point. And, and when I got back on it, like the growth was not happening anymore. It mm. literally stopped at that point. I think some of it was over the summer, so many people just deleted their accounts and got off of social media because it was so, so much anxiety, right? Especially sort of a lot of anxieties came to a head around that specific scenario. And, but the other thing was I'd taken some, I took some time off. And so the, I've, I've had some growth, but it's like, if I take time off, it feels like it takes me like five or six weeks before I'm really growing again on Instagram. And I kind of hate how present you have to be. If you're an independent or you're a musician or even a label artist who's not on the tip top, like you got to stay on it because that's, that's your only way to build. That's the only way people are going to hear you is if you are, if you're growing. And once again, I built my career starting with MySpace, like rolling my followers over, you know, to each, you know, different platform. I would get up every morning in the MySpace days and add 50 people. I'd friend request 50 people. So without being on a record label and having no marketing department, I had, I don't remember how many, but it was like, I remember feeling like at one point, this is an impressive number of MySpace followers. Like I have more MySpace followers than MySpace friends than almost anybody I know. Um, then when Facebook and Twitter came along, I rolled all of those over to Facebook and Twitter. But the problem is like it used to be, when I posted on Instagram, everyone would see my post. If you followed me, unless you're following like 500, 600 people, you know, you would see me. If you're following 600 people, then you'd have to be on when I posted or whatever. But now it's sort of like Instagram only shows my post to a small group of my followers. Unless I'm working the algorithms hard, it shows them to more. And then I have to pay money if I want them all to see it, you know, um, which is fine. They own the platform, but if you're not doing that, it's hard, right? It's hard to keep people's attention. It's hard to stay connected with people because it, the it's not just the social media aspect. It's that it's the streaming aspect. So once again, it used to be that like I only had to sell you a CD once every couple of years. If you can you can sell like 70, 80,000 CDs a year, I only have to sell you once, right? And then I'll come back and hopefully sell you again in 2 years. But with streaming, I need you to go stream my song every single day. I need you to keep coming back. So streaming is not as much about here's my product. It's almost like, it's more like a, I become a fast food restaurant. I need you to buy a burger for me once a week for the rest of your right, life. Right, because you're making pennies per burger instead of... Exactly. Yeah, unpack unpack the economics of, of the recording artist sure. today. Like, I don't even quite know. Mm -hmm. You're like, I got to make... You're making what from your music? What from tours? What from yep. I, I don't know what other merch. revenue streams? Yeah, merch. How yep. is it working today? Because back in the day, it was shows and CDs. It was plastic discs. Oh yeah, and shows. Now what is it? Yeah, well, no. So for most artists, so these are the different ways you can make money as an artist: licensing, merch, your shows, streams, and then sponsorships. Those are the five major ways you can make money as an artist. The way I approach these different things is streaming pays for the record now. I don't. It's, I have a two, I have a two, a, a two part strategy with streaming. Is number one, I want the streaming to pay for the record and the marketing, just pay for that stuff, right? Because I still make fairly expensive records as far as an independent is concerned. You know, um, I probably make I'm not not expensive label records, but I probably spend about as much as a label would on an artist who isn't one of their like top to your artists, you know, as opposed to like more indie who'd spend less. But so I still spend label. Anyway, so I want the streaming to pay for the album and the marketing of the album. And then part two is after it's paid for itself, I have a catalog that's generating passive income. 
So right now I have, I think it's eight original albums, but I own like 12 or 14 albums as a whole where there's like B-sides and covers and um, live records, right? So I think I own like 12 albums. And, uh, you know, so, and this is not the actual finances, but just for an understanding, if they're all paid for, and let's say they're all, let's say like I haven't played music in a hundred years and no, and very few people care, but what if each one of those albums is making a hundred dollars a month and I have 12 albums there, that's $1,200 with the passive income. So, you know, once it's paid for, but now it could take two years to pay for an album. So you used to try and do it in the first six weeks, first six weeks pay for the album, Second six weeks paid for the next album, and then the next six weeks was um, how I made my money. And then people at that point are not as interested as they were. Did you come out with a record and you're not marketing it? You're not on social media, so it's sort of like you work real hard to get in front of people and you stay in front of them for the first three months, and then it's sort of like, all right. Then they would call it um, off-season plan. Like, what is your sort of... It's the back end of your cycle where you would like maybe tour as an opener or do some other promotional things to try and connect with new fans because your existing fans are already bored with you. They've already listened to your record, seen their show, and you're done. But uh, now it could take a couple years to pay for a record. But once I do, I have this catalog. As an indie, once again, a label artist can do this. As an indie, I have this whole catalog that creates passive income for me, you know, for hopefully for years to come. So that's sort of the second part of my strategy is to pay it off and build up this catalog so that later in life I have this like hopefully people still like me and when I die I can give it to my kids you know and they can have passive income as well off of the who knows if they're streaming at that point but that's kind of the idea right now so your bills and retirement and all of you know planning that all paid then by the other streams like yep sponsorships or licensing or to- yep. you know touring yep so sponsorships usually non-profits you know who will help basically they'll pay some of my expenses on the road so that i can help them grow what they're doing you know and it's, when you're working with a non-profit it's always like they gotta make money i can't just be taking from them so it's usually lower level because i don't want to take too much from the non-profits you know because they're trying to help poor people in other countries and stuff and so but but you know I'll try and partner with someone like that that I really believe in and uh usually they'll pay for travel ticket sales will pay for the band and then once all that's paid for I make what's on top of that I make the merch if there's any sort of VIP money like I make that then licensing is great but it's sort of like few and far between and then once I mean, you guys are in film, so you understand once you find something that's working, you're like, you kind of want to stick with it. So if everyone uses the same people, um, once something works really well. Um, But I have had, I have landed some licensing, but there's just, it's hard for me anyway, at least where I'm at, to build a career. It's to me, that's always just an awesome bump. But some people like make uh, all their money off licensing. That's sort of their bread and butter. But for me, it's like, that's the kind of stuff like I hope I get. And I, I try it every now and then. It's like a Hail Mary, like the Terminator thing. I think I did that two or three years before it actually came up. You know, I just did it and it was there and forgot about it. And then my friend Tommy, he's with the, the licensing company. He's like, hey, there's, uh, I think we're going to pitch this to Terminator. Can you redo the vocal? I was like, yeah. And out of nowhere, <laughs> it's like, boom. And it happened. And I didn't know until the day the trailer came out. I literally got a message saying the trailer might come out this week, but even at that point, there was no guarantee they were going to use my song. Mm-hmm. And then it took them probably six or nine months to even pay. So licensing is, um, I haven't cracked the code on that just yet. Yeah. I was curious how, what, uh, you know, how it fits into your portfolio. I imagine it's a pretty large part of it. Um, the, uh, what did, what did uh, the independent film market in, pays in peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? <laughs> Isn't that <laughs> Thomas, how we were able to yeah, right. afford him for, for fair? Well, there is a, do you still have any of those saved up? You still have a peanut butter sandwich. I, I paid you for your music, yep. right? <laughs> I did. It goes right into the account, I, I think. There are, there is now though. It didn't exist back then, but uh, at least not that I know of, but there's, um, there are groups that do micro licenses. So I've got friends who make like, you know, forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year off of micro licenses. Wow. So they're most of them are not artists. A lot of them are musicians who play with other artists or in the industry, 
but they uh, they're able to produce on their own, which is how they're able to make that money because they're not paying many of the musicians and they're doing most of the work themselves. But there's you know like uh, Music Bed or Marmoset. There's some of those types of companies that will mm-hmm. you know like if you want a wedding video, uh, you can pay you can buy a small license to use it for your wedding video, and you'll be allowed to post it on YouTube. You know you'll get a license where they let you post it onto YouTube. So it's a different license. Um, which that didn't really exist when I, um, several years ago, I signed publishing deals and we only wanted to land the bigs, you Mm, know? So really it's only in the last year that I set up a deal with music bed where the, um, people who are doing church bumpers or wedding videos or birthday parties and and stuff like that, they can buy a micro license. Do you have a, like a sense for the next 10 years, 20 years, I want to be doing this. I want to achieve that. You talk about, you know, your sense of success and achievement and kicking the, the finish line further, you know, but you're also smart and you're planning. So like, what do you, are you working towards something or are you, you know, just still trying to sort of just take it as it comes? Are you living a little more in the present maybe? Well, the tough part is I was working towards something, but COVID has forced me to take a two-year break, Mm. you know, from the touring side of things. So it's sort of like all I've got, it's great that I've got this time to make new music, so I am creating new music, but it's sort of like just everything's been on hold. And it's not just that you can't go out and tour, it's that no one knows when you can go tour. So it's hard to put together a plan. Yep. It's hard to say, all right, we're going to go tour in the spring, so let's create some this is some music and let's get some video and let's let's lead up let's figure out what's going to be the road to this tour and how are we going to like make this happen like and so that's been tough but i will say this like a little bit maybe different answer than you're expecting i feel like it's taken me some time to to realize it like i'm actually doing okay you know and it's okay if i stay where i am um but what i'm more interested in is how am i serving my audience i'm sort of starting to realize that the audience is um is it's a it's like a it's a major privilege to have an audience at all and it's it's a major opportunity to serve people in meaningful ways and for the longest time i don't i couldn't articulate this i'm not saying i believe this you know explicitly but i think looking back i think i saw the audience as people who existed to serve my dream Mm -hmm. right and that's, you know, that's common. And I wouldn't have felt that way if you'd asked me 10 years ago. But looking back, I'm like, I think maybe that was part of it. I think maybe that I was, I thought I was doing something good or I intended to do something good. But for the most part, I was expecting the audience to serve my dream. And now I'm realizing, like, how amazing is it that I get to serve them in these next few years? And how am I going to serve them? And I've realized, like, when things were going really well for me, it's when I knew the story that I had to tell, and I knew the people that that benefited from hearing that story, and it worked really hard to serve those people with what I'd been given, right? So I'm not, when I'm writing the songs, I'm not thinking, like, oh, how do I write a song that serves X, Y, Z? That's not really the way I do it. I sit down and write the song that I need to write, but then I ask, all right, now who does this song need to serve? This song exists has got to exist to serve somebody, you know? And I realized, like, I have this relationship with all these people who like my music, and so a lot of times the music I'm writing is for them, even though I'm not doing it on purpose. But after I create it, it's like, okay, I'm on this planet for a reason. I have these specific songs for a reason. Like, who are they for? Who who needs them? And so figuring out how to tell my story in a way that offers people an in to my story and inroad into my story. Like that's what I'm mostly excited about these days. I would love to sell out stadiums at some point. Like I would love to do all that. That may, I've played stadiums. It's been great, but you know, that may never happen. I may never headline red rocks and sell out red rocks, but I got to play red rocks and it was great. Right. I got to play mm-hmm. a sold out show. They just didn't pay to see me, but they acted like I was the headliner. The crowd was <laughs> excited. I was like, that's great. I've done that, and I want, I'd love to be the headliner. I'd love to be the one who's doing that. But whether or not I'm ever that person, like I, I just think it's, I have an incredible opportunity to serve people in what I do. And so I'm real excited about figuring out how to do that. Also, uh, a lot of things that I think younger artists and maybe people in other business don't understand, 
And we talk about a marketing marketing funnel. Are you guys familiar with a marketing funnel? So at the top, you have people who are unaware of you. Unaware of you whatsoever. They don't know your name. They don't know your song. They don't know you exist. You're nothing. Step one is creating awareness, right? Then you go, and there's a number of different types of marketing funnels. I'll just give you an example of one. You go from unawareness to simple awareness. Maybe they've heard your name. Maybe they've heard your song. They know you exist. They have no real experience with you. They probably have, don't know anything about you, but they know that you're in the world. The first step is working unawareness into awareness. You want to create awareness, and then you want to move from awareness, you want to move to interest, interested in what they're doing. From interest, you want to move them to engaged, right? From engaged, you want to go to conversion. Conversion is more like, okay, you're on my email list, right? Now I've worked, so I've worked you from unaware to aware to interested to engaged then I've converted you to now you're on my email list a lot of people would consider that monetization so conversion probably to most people would be like oh I sold you something I sold you a ticket sold you a piece of merch right but then there's a step after conversion right which is advocacy mm. right if someone moves to where they're not just they don't just willing to buy your stuff they're not just willing to come to your shows they're not just willing to watch your stuff like they actually love everything and they believe in you and they are going to tell the whole world about what you're doing but it's a funnel because the groups get smaller and smaller as you go down so that smallest group is a sort of your group of advocates here's the thing i think most young entrepreneurs do wrong is they focus more on on the awareness group and then the conversion right mm -hmm. they want to skip from uh awareness to conversion mm -hmm. right direct marketing they post too much marketing on their stuff they're not mm -hmm. offering any opportunity they're not telling their story it's just like album cover t-shirt show it's just like marketing no one cares about that unless they're already super invested they don't care at all mm -hmm. right and so it's like you have to create these opportunities for people to deepen their relationship with you. And the better you know their, your story and the story you're telling, the better you can do that. But the other mistake that I think a lot of young people, young entrepreneurs make, young artists make, is they ignore the smallest group. And the reason they do it is because that small group isn't exciting. They're not sexy. They're, they're the smallest by number. So they're not impressive a lot of times. Because it's not like, yeah, I just posted something and I just got a hundred thousand likes. Well, that's great. How many of those people were just clicking? Like, how many of those people actually engaged, actually know your story, actually care about you, right? Like, that would be a much smaller group. But I think those people are the ones who are actually supporting your career. And the other thing that those people are doing that most people don't realize is those people are actually your best investment in creating awareness, mm. right? Because you can put something out there, you can market to get your stuff in front of whoever you want, but if they don't care, right, they're not going to give you a chance. But if one of their friends, someone they care about and someone they love, someone they respect happens to be one of your advocates says, hey, this changed my life. This was the greatest. Someone texted me the other day. They wanted to see, they asked me what movies I recommended. And I was like, I need to text Thomas because your opinion <laughs> matters. If you say a movie is good, I'm going to see it. Yeah. Right? Because so you're an advocate for that movie, right? Yeah. So maybe that was super complicated, but like, I think people have to understand how that works. And you can't often skip steps. You rarely go from mm. unawareness down to advocate or even from mm. unawareness down to conversion and monetization. You have to have a plan for each of those groups of people and how to give them opportunities to further invest in your story. But I, I said all that to say this, that I think one of the things I want to do better is I want to focus more on those people who have followed me for 10, 15, 20 years, those people who, like, who uh, have invested a lot of their life in what I'm doing and who share you know, because I feel like I've not done a great job all the time of taking care of those people. So that's, that's kind of mm. one of my goals for the future. I also think for longevity's sake, those are the people who are going to, they may not always be the people who blow your career up, but they are the people who are going to keep you employed. Mm. Because they're the people who care enough. 
that even if you put out a bad album, they're like, ah, the next one will be good. They're not going to tap <laughs> out because they've been investing in you for a long time. And so I think for the future, I want to invest in them uh, in ways that I haven't maybe always in the past. That's awesome. I'm curious if you had to go back 20 years or like when you were in high school, what album do you think would still hold up today? Like that you put it on and it would just slap for like, you know, modern audience because, you know, maybe it just would for you. But if like you played it for people, what do you think would hold up after all these years? Two artists recently that I recently listened to and thought this exact thing about was one was Dr. Dre. And the chronic mm, sounds the incredible. Chronic. It still sounds unbelievable. I heard him remaster that recently and was yep. shocked by how great it sounds. It's unreal. And uh, Mary J. Blige, she still sounds incredible. Like, I mean, sonically, a lot of things have changed. But see, the thing with Dr. Dre is, and I think he might have produced Mary J. He's produced a lot of, even today, I think he produced uh, Kendrick Lamar. I mean, he's still like... The man, I think. But he, even in the uh, early 90s, he was sampling uh, music from the 70s. And so even today, it still feels timeless. Mm -hmm. like it doesn't, when I hear it, I don't think, oh, this is 1991, 1992. To me, it's like, whoa. If I heard a brand new record that sounded like this, I would be stoked. That's a good one, though. The Chronic, 1992. I was a little kid. I mean, the first tape I ever bought, the first tape, was um, Warren G. Regulators. Yeah. Um, and I had to bribe the person at Tower Records to sell it to me. <laughs> and I got it taken away within a week. But I, <laughs> man, I wore that thing out the week I had it. I think Dre produced that one. I think he did. I think because that was 94. Yep. And uh, he was already producing by then. Yep. My great grandmother took me and my brother to a store and we each bought a tape. I don't, I must have been four or five years old. And I don't know why I picked it out, but you're going to be so proud of me. It was Greetings from Asbury Park by Bruce Springsteen. Ah, that's amazing. And my brother got Beach Boys. I don't remember what album. So do you want to you want to come down on something one or two, Thomas? You want to just really for an album from like 20, 20 years ago or high school in that kind of range. Octung Baby, I feel like is still an incredible album, even sonically. Okay. And and you too does not age all the necessarily well. Uh, you know, a lot of their older stuff feels very 80s. Their newest stuff, they're still never quite hit the peak. But Octung Baby is sort of a capsule of something that's the stuff they were doing on the album that's still stuff people don't do and you listen to it and it still feels kind of current and relevant for me. Well, I, I obviously had some time to think about it since I was thinking about this earlier, but, uh, and there are a lot of good options. I mean, Lauren Hill came out in 99 oh, and, yeah. or 98 maybe and Nine, Nine Inch Nails, The Fragile was like, the, changed everything for me, but I, I don't think that a lot of people would be into that. If I had to pick two, that if you played them today for somebody that I think would hold up, I would say Rage Against the Machine, Battle of Los Angeles, and Refused, The Shape of Punk to Come. That's probably one that not as many people have heard of, but I still think that if you listen to it today, it would uh, it get you if, you, if you like punk in any way. Listening to the Battle of Los Angeles and Evil Empire, which are both over 20 years now, you could you could say, oh, they wrote those last year. I mean, they're talking about police brutality and, you know, economic inequality. And you're like, oh, yeah, this, is this a new band that just came out? <laughs> yeah, talk about a band with a sense of mission. They were they set the standard back then. Mm -hmm. Are we all animals? Are we all animals shopping in our teeth and claws stocking up on cannonballs? Okay, stay with us. Two Picks is coming up, and John Mark talks about the country he says everyone should visit. Seriously, I'm booking a ticket now. Live by the law, the law of the jungle. So as we uh, close up this episode, we're going to do two picks, two recommendations. I was going to do, you know, an indie film because uh, I thought that'd be cool, and I've, saw, I've seen a bunch this week. What I've really been thinking about is WandaVision on Disney+. Plus. It is a Marvel MCU TV show, TV series I had no interest in. I mean, I like the Marvel Universe to the extent that I watch them because my kids, they've been getting better and better. I used to think it was kind of garbage. But WandaVision is actually one of the most fun, inventive TV shows, pieces of writing I've seen in a long time. It's a really unique kind of conceit where, you know, Wanda, who's the Scarlet Witch, and Vision, 
who's this, you know, sentient being are in these, an old sitcom. So each episode is a different style of sitcom and they really nail it. They really do it right. And the first couple episodes, you're like just going along with it. And then something doesn't seem to be uh, real or you're trying to, there's a mystery. And then the, the slow disclosure of the mystery really through the first seven episodes is really strong, really compelling. Episode eight, they kind of let the cat out of the bag and it kind of devolves into just sort of standard Marvel world. And there's one more episode. It's a nine episode season, but it's worth it. It's fun. It's on Disney plus one division as someone who really had no stake in the game. It is a lot of fun. All right. I, I have not seen it. I, I've seen commercials for it. Just wildly confused yeah. by it. And, and you will be for the first few episodes. But yeah, definitely. Okay. You, have you, you watched it, John Mark? Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I love it. I, I'm trying not to like give anything away, but it's the whole thing is a metaphor for something. I don't mm. want to say what it is. Mm. It's it's a beautiful metaphor. I think keep it in the spirit of this episode. Um, I think I'm going to give a music pick. It's not new. It is from 2020, but I still it's been heavy rotation. Um, and it's RTJ four by run the jewels. Um, I think is just, uh, it's one of my top picks of for music for 2020. So anybody that's familiar with killer Mike and LP run the jewels, um, obviously it's their band or group. I don't know. What do you call it when it's rap? But anyway, it's, that's the two of them. And RTJ four is fantastic. So anyway, check it out. Great. My recommendation for the episode is the country of Japan. I want to recommend Japan. Oh, uh, beautiful. You, did you go recently? I did. Well, yeah, I mean, it was the last, one of the last places I went to before COVID. When I say recently, I mean anything, yep. the before you know, times. everything paused <laughs> in March. October of 2019. I went to Japan in October. We went to the UK in November. But I want to recommend Japan for a number of reasons. Number one is the food. Obviously, if you like sushi and you like Japanese food, like it's obviously obviously the best in the world because it's actual Japan. But what a lot of people don't know is that Tokyo has more Michelin star restaurants than any other city in the world. So they do all food good in Japan. They also really love fried chicken. But if you want, obviously, the greatest sushi and sake in the world, like Japan, is the place. The entertainment is incredible. The visuals, the architecture, the history... Um, it's just the art museums, the technology, it's just a fantastic and exciting place. It's also one of the safest countries in the world. So you can walk anywhere and never feel out of place, never feel like you're going to turn a bad corner. Um, and I think they think Americans are like cartoons. At least they thought I was like a cartoon. I mean, so, we are. Yeah. <laughs> I think that, you know, I took pictures with lots of kids <laughs> and not because they knew my music. I had no idea I played music. Like, I think they're just like, you are the hairiest, largest person I've ever seen. <laughs> right. You look like a cartoon. <laughs> exactly. We were taking pictures at some of the big shrines and uh, kids would come up and make a line and want to take pictures with this big, hairy, white person. And, Surely uh, there's a plenty of international Americans or white people, or no? no. Really? It's, it, it, surprisingly, wow, none. Surprisingly few. Yeah, we were there during like the Rugby World Cup, I think, and so there were a bunch of people from Australia and the UK, but very few, very few. Now there are a lot of internationals. There's a lot of Chinese and Korean, sure, and um, people from because Asia is huge. I think like because we're so far away from it, we think of Asia as though it's like one country, but the yeah, Asia, monoblock. Yeah, Asia the Asian world is probably bigger than the um the Western world. The, the entire Western yeah. world. No, yeah. It's so massive. Like we're not <laughs> I mean, America is a big deal because it's a superpower, but like I, I doubt they get up and think about us every day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like I, I, and of course they're hosting the Olympics. Which, I know. You yeah, know, the twenty twenty Olympics in twenty twenty one. Yep. Yeah. You know, I, one thing I loved about Japan was multiple times I was on my phone, like posting something to Instagram, and I looked like I was lost. And a person would walk up to me and try and help me find directions. Hmm. Like, I remember, like, we, we were walking in the rain and I slipped and fell. And this old lady immediately walked up and helped me get up. Like, it's just hmm. so interesting. I mean, you would expect that kind of thing in a small town, but we're talking about Tokyo. Mm. It's yeah, like being in the, New the York. Biggest cities in the world. Yeah. You've become an advocate. Yes, I've become <laughs> an advocate Japan. for Japan. Well, John Mark, thank you so much for your time. We will have to bring you back. Yep, I would love it. Yeah, man. Thanks again so much for your time. Thanks, man.
Thanks again to John Mark for being so forthcoming with his journey. We wanted to get to a lot of questions on craft and creative of writing songs. We didn't have the time, so he will come back for a craft-focused conversation. This episode's music was, of course, all John Mark, and you can listen to his amazing work wherever you listen to music. Stay up to date with him at johnmarkmcmillan.com, on Instagram at johnmarkmcmillan, and Twitter at johnmarkmick, and all the other socials. He's everywhere. If you listen to this episode, I will encourage you, go buy the album. Don't give him a few pennies on Spotify. Yes, give him a few dollars. Give him a few dollars. Or what are you doing with the dollars anyway? Or make like a video and micro license his songs. Right. Or just send him a, a money. He probably has a Patreon. Just finance his. You know his how about this, Thomas? Put his home address. Put his home address in the show notes and just mail him cash. I, or just walk by with a with an envelope full of money. That would probably be, be the least yeah, creepy thing to do. Definitely. Okay, everybody. You know where to find us. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, elsewhere. Rate us, review us, tell your friends about us. If you want to stay connected to us throughout the month, you can follow our Instagram at Two Friends Pod And send us emails. We've been getting emails coming in. Well, just one from my brother. But still, it's fun. Oh, hey, so many two emails. with a podcast.com is our email address. <laughs> Let me say it again so Justin is not speaking over me. Hey, at Two Friends with a podcast.com is that email address. And yeah, 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 thomasstory.com is me. Badtheologypictures.com is our company. Justin it doesn't exist on the internet. And we love you. Thanks for listening. <laughs> However, my home address will be in the show notes. You can also send me dollars. Just one, though, because that's all I deserve. I will say that Thomas does like to cut. Uh, he does like a you know a, a mashup of what we say just to make us sound like horribly misogynistic yeah, yeah. and racist. You're about to get canceled, stuff, so. John Mark. No. <laughs> <laughs>